A week before we came here, a Chinese vessel rammed into a Philippine fishing boat anchored near Recto Bank in the South China Sea within the exclusive economic zone of the Philippines. 22 Filipino fishing crew were left, in the words of the armed forces of the Philippines, to the mercy of the elements, and would have died had they not been rescued six hours later by a Vietnamese vessel. That the Chinese vessel has so grievously violated international norms of conduct is, while unfortunate, not surprising. What is truly tragic has been the response of some of our top government officials. President Duterte remained mum about the encounter for several days, only to dismiss it later as a little maritime incident. And then it occurred to me, dear friends and comrades, compatriots, mga mahal ko mga kababayan, mga kapwa kong nagmamahal kay inang bayan, that that maritime hit and run is a perfect metaphor for the state of affairs in the Philippines. Those 22 Filipino fishers are the Filipino people. First, victimized by the brute aggression of stronger forces, and then made to suffer further from the callousness of those who should have come to their aid. As we say in the Philippines, na hit and run na, tapos pagdating sa presinto, pagdating sa barangay, hindi pinaniniwalaan. Oh, I failed to say uh, buenas noches to the uh, uh, compañeros who are here tonight. So, what a somber way to begin a speech, I know, but I suppose we all feel nothing if not somber today. I'm right in the thick of things, so I feel the stress every day, but I imagine that watching from afar, watching a country you love, and perhaps still call home, fritter away long-fought gains, gains that you also fought for. I know that there are here among us activists from the martial law era, valiant Filipino-Americans who sustained the struggle against the martial law dictatorship and for the return to democratization of the Philippines. You did that all over the United States, and some of the most valiant struggles were waged here in Seattle, and some of the most painful sacrifices were paid here in Seattle. Um, I imagine that watching from afar is its own kind of despair. This is why communities and huddles like this are important. We share our despair, but we also build hope. I thank the Friends of Akabayan USA and the wonderful Phil Am community here in Seattle and the Filipino Community Center for hosting today's event. I thank all of you for coming out here to listen and have a conversation with each other. Magandang araw sa ating lahat at happy Independence Day na rin. I've been asked to speak before you today to talk about the post-midterm elections and the challenges it presents for democracy. But there is a point I want to make clear at the outset. The midterm elections of 2019 were a critical turning point, yes, but the systematic, deliberate, targeted assault on democracy by the administration was set into motion far longer before that. The midterm elections were a major debacle. Malaki-laking hit and run ito. And many Filipinos felt abandoned to the elements. Pero ilan beses na tayo ginagalusan? Like a boat, and Seattle is, can speak about this, like a boat, but punctured repeatedly with tiny holes in its sail, its bow, its hull, with the goal of capsizing it. As that saying goes, death by a thousand cuts. We would need the whole day to talk about these thousand cuts and the many ways they make us bleed. But I'd like to focus on three particular cuts. The weaponization of the law, which uh, I had a wonderful conversation about with the Phil Am lawyers yesterday with Attorney Jay. The weaponization of the law, the manufacturing of an us versus them, the neutering of the legislature. All these lead to one end, an unchecked, 
overpowerful executive. Thanos, with all the infinity stones. Cersei, oh, si Daenerys ba, with wildfire. Since 2016, President Duterte and his allies have used the legal system as a weapon against enemies of the administration. The playbook is simple and Marcosian. Stuff the Supreme Court with grateful appointees and rest easy knowing that legal decisions will be ruled in favor of the appointing power. As many of us know, the first casualty has been Senator Laila de Lima, outspoken critic of the president, now languishing in jail on charges that were based solely on the testimony of convicted drug lords. The administration then turned its sights on Chief Justice Maria Lourdes Sereno and used quo warranto proceedings to oust a public official who, according to the Constitution, can only be ousted by impeachment. Maria Ressa, Rappler's editor-in-chief, also found herself charged with various cases from tax fraud to cyber libel. And the list goes on and on. Sa totoo lang po, I too have pending criminal cases. Kinasuhan po ako ng dating Justice Secretary Vitaliano Aguirre at ng kanyang mga kaalyado ng kidnapping at wiretapping. So, ingat lang po kayo. You have an accused wiretapper and kidnapper in your midst. This weaponization of the law is not just to suppress the enemies of the state. A spineless judiciary is also used to rubber stamp executive decisions no matter how abhorrent. This explains the despicable Supreme Court decisions in the past years, allowing Ferdinand Marcos to be buried at the libingan ng mga bayani, affirming the extension of martial law in Mindanao, and acquitting former President Gloria Macapagal-Arroyo of plunder charges. Reisa Robles, writing on the effects of a then Marcos-led Supreme Court, said, The lick spittle justices and judges, by their silence, acquiescence, or active participation, would enable the regime to get away with the wholesale murder, torture, and atrocities. Aren't we feeling just a little bit of deja vu, mga kababayan? Now we go to the second cut creating a mythical enemy to sow false divisions. This is a populist's go-to ploy, manu manufacturing an other, creating an us versus them. Since President Duterte assumed the presidency on June 30th, 2016, there are now around 20,000 corpses of persons killed in the name of the war on drugs. How did he manage? to get us Filipinos to acquiesce by demonizing drug users, by lumping drug users with drug traffickers. Let's watch this video. Hitler massacred three million Jews. Now, there is three million, there's a three million drug addict, there are. I'd be happy to slaughter them. At least, if Germany had Hitler, the Philippines would have, but, you know, my victims, I would like to be all criminals to finish the problem of my country and save the next generation from perdition. We've sung so low that this kind of language is not just deemed acceptable, it's applauded. Human rights advocates, foreign or Filipino, are ridiculed and threatened. Strong women are targeted by misogynistic attacks. Fake news is peddled to demonize opposition figures. All of those who are critical of the regime are labeled as the enemy. When we are not ridiculed and insulted, we are threatened and made to feel unsafe. I'm also threatened with rape on social media. Hypothetical questions have been asked if my children should be kidnapped. Members of Akbayan party, my party, can't even campaign freely on the ground because they are threatened. I saved the best for last <laughs> because now we talk about the elections. 
As you perhaps all know, the country handed President Duterte an indisputable victory in May of this year, a 12-0 victory in the Senate, and an overwhelming supermajority in the House. Come June 30th, there will be only four opposition senators in the Senate, Franklin Drilon, Francis Pangilinan, Laila de Lima, and me. There are three comparatively more independent senators in the majority, Senators Ping Lakson, Grace Poe, Nancy Binay. While they give hope, it's difficult to assume they will always vote with the opposition, especially now so early, so long before the 2022 general elections. What are the implications of this? First of all, charter change would be a done deal if the president wants it. To convene itself into a constituent assembly, a three-fourths vote of all members of Congress is needed. There is still a debate in if the House and Senate vote jointly or separately, but even if voting separately prevails, you would still need six or more senators to vote against it. There are only three opposition senators who can vote on a measure on the floor, as Senator Lila is not allowed to in absentia from prison. Second, a two-thirds vote of the Senate sitting as an impeachment court is needed to impeach a public official. This means you need eight senators to stop an impeachment. Vice President Lenny Robredo remains a thorn in the side of President Duterte. I will not be surprised if impeachment is in the game plan. Third, a two-thirds vote also is needed to concur in a treaty this means that the president could enter into any and all treaties with, say, China and be certain of legislative imprimatur. And these are just the big implications. Hindi pa kasama dito yung pag-expel kay Senator Laila bilang miembro ng Senado, ang pag-box out sa amin from holding chairpersonships over committees at iba pang paraan ng pagpapatahimik at pananakot. Of course, there are the three more independent majority senators. Hopefully, we can have issue-based tactical alliances with them. Let me share with you, too, that the 2019 elections have hit me personally and profoundly as well. For my party, Akbayan, suffered its biggest defeat in our history by failing to clinch even one seat. We are in the process of assessing our internal deficiencies, but let me tell you this. It now takes 500 million pesos, at about 50 pesos to one US dollar, 500 million pesos to win in the party list race. The party list system is now being used as an extension of political dynasties. What was once the domain of the marginalized and underrepresented sectors has been hijacked as well. And yet, we all soldier on. I'm happy and proud to share that in this hostile political environment, my office has managed to pass 13 laws, most of them in the fields of health and women's and children's rights. One of our most important wins is the expanded maternity leave law, which increases the number of paid maternity leave days for Filipina women from the previous 60 to 105, with solo moms getting up to 120 days leave. Fathers and alternate caregivers too can benefit because the mother can allocate up to seven days from her maternity leave to her husband or partner or another alternate caregiver. Another health-related victory is the mental health law, which is the country's first true national policy on mental health. Through it, mental health programs will now be established at the community level Curricula will include age-appropriate mental health education and a dedicated budget for mental health will be allocated. A third triumph we secured is the Strengthened Anti-Hospital Deposit Act. It increases the penalties of hospitals and medical practitioners who require any form of deposit for treating emergency patients. This squarely addresses cases we've personally witnessed of hospitals blatantly asking for deposits before treating their patients. These are just some of our victories in the past three years. I've been able to do this while playing a fiscalizer role in the Senate. 
calling out the executive when necessary, speaking out against corruption and conflict of interest as I see it, protecting our sovereignty and national interests from Chinese encroachment especially, as for example, in the West Philippine Sea. Dear friends, dear Kababayan, I don't want to lie to you. The next three years will be tough. Things will get worse before they get better. We have a president with a popularity rating that is not going down, despite all the issues hurled against him. But this is also what I want to tell you. There are Filipinos and Phil Americans who will not take this sitting down. There are many of us, some like us, who've seen the atrocities of the years of the Marcos dictatorship and don't wish to have them visited on the present and future generations. And some younger than us who, unlike the president, understand their history. We will not let our country go down without a fight. That's why we need your help. We need your help to sustain the resistance for the next three years. Three very challenging years. And with our unrelenting efforts, with solidarity from all overseas Filipinos here in the United States and elsewhere, with hope abiding and our spirit unyielding, we persist and we will triumph. This is a boat that will not sink. Marami pong salamat sa inyong lahat. Salamat tabi sa Indogabos. Muchas gracias. Mabuhay po tayong lahat. You mentioned one of the reasons why Fayan was not able to secure a seat in the recent election. Do you want to expand on that? I'd be interested to hear more about Fayan's campaign in Spain. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we just went through a two day assessment and direction setting. Uh, we started out the campaign very confident that given what we pursued was our core membership of about 28,000. And then our campaign and at the same time our grand organizational consolidation strategy of bumping up the numbers to uh, 100,000, including new recruited members uh, whom we would um, begin forming through the Advice Orientation Seminar campaign training, and whom after we won, because we presumed we would win, uh, we would continue the formation of ASK party members and we would convert our barangay or village campaign committees because we were doing a groundwork in the campaign on the ground but we would convert these BCCs or village campaign committees into regular uh, party chapters or party committees. The political terrain has changed so much since we first helped pass the party law, the first electoral reform uh, 21 years ago, 22, 19, and then we registered with the Commission on Elections and first ran into it with the party's election the following year of 1998. After coming in large part from the boycott tradition, whenever elections uh, would be called, because most of the elections we went through, especially during the martial law dictatorship, were not to be believed as real, you know, contests or with a level playing field. So we came together since the early, mid-90s, 1994, 1995, different organizations to form a uh, party with a real uh, philosophy or ideology, with a real platform of governance. And this is what we would campaign to people on. And this is what we would report back to them in every subsequent. Um, election, our track record, and then our uh, evolved platform for, for the next term. So we were confident that given our track record of we uh, 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 what we thought a grounded platform having worked in the House, in the Senate, with various uh, partner uh, social movements, labor, urban poor, uh, uh, peasants, and fisher folk, indigenous people on a more modest scale, women, youth, uh, uh, persons with disabilities, senior citizens, LGBTIQA+. Um, we were confident going into this campaign uh, that we would remain one of the stakeholders 
uh, in the party system through the proportional representation because we were uh, organized among and representing the agenda of the marginalized and underrepresented. But uh, that that 20 percent of mere 20 percent of the house reserved by the constitution and the law for the parties has been invaded in various ways, bigger and bigger, and richer and richer the past election. So first, what we call fake party lists uh, of traditional politicians trying to sneak in their relatives and friends as representing uh, basic sectors. And then another way of uh, party lists from uh, regional bailiwicks of political dynasties who saw the party list as, oh, a backdoor to get one more seat in the house. Um, and then in this third, uh, this tsunami <laughs> that we didn't anticipate, so we did prepare for well enough, we weren't able to hold the line despite the efforts of the, the Casamas and Romans on the ground. Uh, this biggest, this tsunami was um, being rich party lists of um, project contractors and other uh, rich centers uh, who ran expensive TV ads for months on end and then who engaged in book buying. So, and, but in the end, um, I always say it's on us. This defeat as our victories. We can't make excuses, we cannot blame our opponents because of course they will do what they do. So now we are in the we are, we are at the moment which we call a refounding process, going through this assessment, uh, setting directions for our party um, in the next years, and trying to help be a part of building a bigger, stronger, more battle ready and more effective opposition uh, so that we can fight better and win with not, I can't say win more, but win in 2020. for uh, being here and sharing such incredible, uh, important uh, information. And my question is, uh, as Filipinos uh, in the diaspora, what is the best way that we can support? Um, Filipinos in the diaspora, you have a treasure trove of experiences, um, learnings, uh, uh, just exposure, not only to different countries, but to different um, political systems, also the different economic systems, different political cultures of citizens, of other ways of organizing communities, sectors, regions, uh, other mechanisms uh, and institutions even of holding your leaders accountable, of giving them your mandate, of renewing it or taking it back, and, um, and uh, affirming your, your basic democratic uh, values. So that is such a, a rich resource also for your kababayan back home. A much younger democracy, here you're centuries old, at home we are decades old, and <clears throat> we're experiencing uh, an unprecedented, and that's why very shocking, unexpected, uh, uh, retrogression. Uh, those of us who were active during martial law, uh, we, you know, thought that that battle was over and done with. It was won conclusively and could not be erased from the history books. Hey, they're even erasing martial law. They're doing this grand historical revisionism project using public funds plundered from the Filipino people that they make it hard for the human rights victims to receive as a small symbolic pittance of recognition from the state that it is accountable for the violations um, uh, against them. Okay, I, I do this everywhere. I lose my train of thought. Okay, so but anyway, it's a treasure. It's a great treasure for Filipinos back home at this stage of our democratization process. Um, thank you. Because um, it was shocking for us to realize that those values we thought we had internalized as a people and institutionalized in our government of human rights, of gender sensitivity, of... Uh, 
hey, democracy and constitutionalism and national sovereignty, you know, not selling out to another country that doesn't recognize your victory at the Hague in the exclusive economic zone in the South China Sea. We, now we realize with a shock that these are not just under attack, but that, oh my God, they're not as resilient as we thought they were. And they have to be protected and defended. They have to be fought for again. So it's every day, it seems. They have to be rebuilt. So after this administration, we have a lot of, of damage to repair. And so your own experiences, here in the United States as well, where you have stronger institutions, we really envy you. When you push back as organized citizens, you have more footholds and handholds to keep your feet planted firmly on the ground and to, to help you uh, push back. Those very institutions uh, are themselves under attack. Uh, what the president cannot co-opt, he tries to intimidate so that his, um, his um, branch of government alone uh, remains standing as uh, the pole around which people can, can uh, organize. I'm so sorry. I, uh, I always talk so long about questions about here and, and in the Philippines, but as aside from sharing all those rich experiences, uh, just from your experience as uh, citizens who vote, um, please uh, uh, apply for dual citizenship so that you can automatically um, participate in the overseas absentee voting, rally, fill arms, especially the young fill arms to get out the vote because um, it's their country too. The country that um, all generations of those who fought for the Philippines handed to us and that our younger comrades are fighting for now, it belongs also to the young um, Phil Am. So I hope you will um, consider that. Thank you. Welcome, Lisa. Uh, so my question is, is um, where do you, what's your assessment of uh, the resistance uh, to Duterte's policies uh, that informed the uh, movement to support your efforts uh, in Congress as well as build the movement uh, to continue to um, take the task as to what they're doing and to build a strong resistance. Thank you for asking um, not just about the resistance in general, but uh, describing that indeed it has to be strengthened not only inside both houses of Congress but maybe even more so outside. So when I talk about Akbayan wanting to help build the opposition, of course it must include the political opposition which was wiped out from the Senate race um, last month. But see, um, if, this, if the very small genuine minority in the House and we a reduced minority in the Senate, uh, you know, we'll lay down on the train tracks to stop the president's trains. We'll filibuster if we must. But if those votes, or if those issues are pushed to a vote, of course, arithmetically, we will always lose the vote. So the backlash to the president, the pushback, must come from outside, must come from the social coalition of organized Filipino citizens in communities, in our different sectors, in our different regions, and institutions as well, pushing back. Uh, we're not in a very good state yet. So obviously with the poor results we were able to generate, uh, we don't have very strong organizational muscles yet to hold the president accountable effectively, uh, to, uh, to win elections, and apparently we also have a lot more work to do to uh, attract more members of this broad coalition, this broad opposition, even from the people who are suffering the most from the issues that we raise. The almost all of the 20,000, and those are just the officially documented persons, almost all of the 20,000 killed in the war on drugs come from poor families have suffered for forever from the social and economic uh, conditions that render poor families vulnerable to depredations of uh, the illegal drug situation in the Philippines. And yet, for example, if you talk to the family of Kian de los Santos, the 17-year-old boy who was killed in Caloocan City, which is the ground zero of extrajudicial killings in Metro Manila, 
You know, they were saying, how could this happen? We campaigned for the president. We voted for him. We support him. Many families who have suffered still would say or come out in the surveys as saying that they support the president. Women, uh, there are wonderful formations. Akbayan women is part of, of one called um, Every Woman. It was first formed to um, uh, defend Senator Laila, but has stayed on the past three years to push back against the president's sexism and misogyny. But we still have sisters in various places in society, even in government, who excuse his sexism uh, and misogyny, or who remain quiet uh, in the face of clear violations of uh, women's rights. Um, and this relates to um, how divided, how polarized our society is, how toxic uh, what should be a debate has become, even on social media. So the, the weaponization of the law in the political spheres is the same um, tone that is imposed in social media to manufacture uh, content of fake news, to distribute it methodically, daily, at particular times of the day, to download it through uh, identified streams and to generate engagement from netizens all over the world, which was um, fantastically, graphically as well, um, researched and, and published by Maria Ressa and her team um, at Rappler. So it, it goes to how divided and, and polarized we are, how much more difficult it is to debate about the issues based on facts the truth, news, uh, data, evidence, let alone have to wade through and sort out before we can talk more productively with each other, um, you know, all, all of this um, fake news. And, and for me, it, it's important because building a bigger, stronger opposition inside and especially outside uh, the Congress means getting through to each other more and really making those connections. Um, Asking more of the right questions, really listening, understanding more, um, building unities about issues that make Filipinos suffer across party lines without you know, stopping calling each other names, Dilawan, DDS, and whatnot. Because I, if people on the ground can experience uh, that you know, we're listening to each other, we have empathy with each other about these issues that make us suffer. Our fishermen are being rammed in our part of the oceans. Um, we, are, we are seeing the constitutional commissions being taken down and a mockery made of political, including electoral exercise. If people can feel that we're listening to each other and that we're going to work together to solve these problems, especially the everyday problems, pocketbook issues of Filipino families, then I think it gives us a little more, even emotional resources, to talk less hostile, in a less hostile way, about our political differences. We can recover mutual respect across political differences, but we build more unities on economic wins for the people, rebuilding the culture of solidarity that has been so and deliberately damaged. The question that I have is, when Congressman Adams is political director here, what kind of message do you want her to send to, to Congressman Adams, who is chair of the House Armed Services Committee, as well as to our, our other Congress people, primarily Democrats? Thank you. Well, aside, in, aside from uh, writing a critical edition on the wealth of nations, <laughs> um, I, I'd just like to uh, express my appreciation that uh, in, the, in the opposition in the Philippines, we really appreciated when uh, some uh, of your U.S. senators and uh, representatives uh, filed a resolution asking for the release of Senator Lila from prison and asking for our government to seize and desist from harassing Maria Ressa, uh, one of the champions of freedom of the press, um, in the Philippines. So these, um, j just to know that fellow legislators, um, uh, peoples across the ocean, you know, other human beings are uh, affirming the values that we are struggling 
to, to live out and to make even more relevant uh, to our people. Just knowing that we are not alone, uh, that we're part of a community of shared values or all over the world, a part of a community of people who have our own different but parallel struggles of making democracy, which uh, someone famously said, and I loved it, that it's the worst system except for all the others. So struggling to make our democracies work. It really means a lot to us, these um, acts of solidarity, to know that other peoples are keeping an eye on us also. And so in that way also we are uh, not alone. And if and when uh, your representatives and senators can participate in exercises like uh, election observation missions or um, uh, just sending communications uh, to our government, uh, particularly in the legislature, but um, I, don't, I, I almost don't dare invite you to write our president because he sort of doesn't welcome international solidarity. But yes, uh, so those various forms of solidarity are very concretely helpful to us in our struggle. I want to offer an observation and then segue into a question from Zach. Um, my observation is that here in the United States, we have a politician who was able to recruit a large mass of the working class, particularly the white working class of America, into voting for him, into in effect voting against their own interests because his policies and actions that worked against their own interests. And yet, a huge segment of the white working class still vigorously supports that guy. And similarly, in the Philippines, we have a politician who has able to recruit and make believers out of huge mass of poor Filipinos. He's acted against their own interests, and yet my own observation, because I talk to Filipinos a lot about it, I know hundreds of poor Filipinos vigorously support your president. So you mentioned some some strategies for for succeeding uh, uh, building the opposition in the Philippines. Uh, you mentioned um, using facts. Yeah, asking the right questions, listening. All these are you know considered reasonable traditional techniques for building popular support. But it's my observation that in the U.S., the liberal democratic sphere has failed to counteract Trump. They're throwing their hands up. And a lot of analysts are saying, for 2020, if the Democratic Party hopes to win the white working class, forget it. It's not going to happen. Recruit. <laughs> so my, my question really is, I pose the same challenge to the left in the Philippines. The left my observation has failed to meet the challenge of Duterte. He's out Fox in every step. Do you see any hope? Do you have any ideas for beyond this? Sorry, sorry my question is so long. No, it's okay. Sorry also, I tend to answer long. Well, even on days that I'm not optimistic or I'm outright pessimistic, uh, I'm always hopeful. And sometimes that's not a description, it's a prescription. I think it's our duty to hope. It's our duty to hope. So when you ask, is there hope, I vigorously nodded my head, yes, even if I don't, we don't know yet um, all the ways how. But um, about the similar experiences of the American and Filipino people with our presidents. Uh, so that's, that's an irony and it's uh, a tragedy. It's a tragedy for us. But we have to rise from it. I, I really do think that we have to understand better what it is about President Duterte that still grabs a lot of Filipinos. Uh, I, not just to make myself feel better or more hopeful, I always do say that we have to account for the factor of fear uh, on the ground in communities which have suffered the most EJKs in the survey results. But still, there is that wide section still of Philippine society, including the poor whose interests he has betrayed, uh, which say or which actually do support him. We have to uh, really make a more solid connection again through organizing on the ground. You know, in the Philippines, we also say, don't agonize, organize. So in these worst of moments, we are so pained, we're so devastated by our results. We have to keep going back to the basics. 
organized. Learn to do it in new ways, but do it this also in some of the same old solid ways. You mentioned the left. It's always interesting for me because I was uh, a student when uh, was the first, oh no, well it wasn't the first. In the 1940s, there was this democratic alliance uh, led or composed mostly of left forces which actually ran uh, in the elections, post post-war elections, but, and they won some seats, including Luis Taruk, uh, the legendary uh, uh, leader of, of the armed movement then, but they were prevented from taking their seats. But more recent history, I was a student when um, the broad left in the Philippines tried to form a united front, and this was the founding congress of Bagong Aliansang Makabayans. Bayan. So the Nat Dems went to it, we Social Democrats went to it, other kinds of Democrats and non-Dems went to it with high hopes for left unity. But the way the process um, uh, unfolded, it was uh, one block, the biggest, the strongest, the most long-standing, which took the leadership alone, the Nat Dems, so we walked out. But I still dream of left unity because it happened again once before, even more recently, during the Edsa Dos uh, revolution, the, the Nat Dems, which, who had since split in the early 90s in the Philippines, uh, the, 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 the dominant section of the Nat Dems, they had made a clean break from the former president Estrada, and we joined, we all joined together uh, in the Edsa Dos. But now, and I've been asked this also by Filipinos at home about uniting uh, again with them, now I, I say I always believe in unity, but it must be a principled unity. And uh, in the past few years, unfortunately, there has been a lot of uh, sectarianism and vanguardism. And most recently, for a few years, they were together with the president, even during these first waves of the extrajudicial killings, even during the first waves of attacks on women. and democracy and constitutionalism, even during this uh, treason with China. So there are issues that have to be um, processed so that we can try again to arrive at the, at the principle of unity. But of course, we shouldn't bother uh, other people in the Philippines about it. Uh, even the various left groups are not enough yet to effectively counter the president. So in fact, less sectarianism all around would help to organize people more to stay that violent hand. Um, let, we can talk about our old and new issues later, but most important for me speaking now, just as Akbayan, just as a, as a democratic left person, uh, we really have to do more and better uh, organizing. And for me, in organizing, there's hope. There's always hope. Hello, good evening. First, I just want to say thank you so much and your organization's courage and hopeful attitude in terms of knowing that there is a future as uh, we work together to make a change. I have a three-part question. Uh, one is that we, have, uh, we understand that those that do not know history are, tend are bound to repeat it. My question has to do with the education of what is the content of the education in, our, in the Philippines because there's a big gap in a lot of people uh, because they do not know about what happened in the martial law, that that was the, a way in which people, uh, the youth, the younger generation, were able to easily um, succumb to the rhetoric of, of the, the Duarte um, government. So that's one the role of education in the Philippines. And if there's any pushback from educators or what have you. The other part has to do with the institution of the Catholic Church. You know, we are, uh, what, 85% of the Philippines are Catholic or so And I just wanted to know, in terms of the leadership there, you know, we're having all of this uh, systematic abuse of human rights. So what is the church stance on that? That's the, and then the last one has to do with the military. Of course, as an institution. 
uh, is there within the military? My, what is the current mindset of the military as it relates to the Duarte? Thank you. Thank you. You're remembering the pre Peron <laughs> guy. So, President Duterte. Um, uh, the, the education system, uh, Romy. Um, unlike Germany, for example, uh, which teaches about the Holocaust so that they will never repeat that experience, we have failed since the 1986 People Power Revolution to ensure that the stories, the history of martial law, the dictatorship, is taught to our students. Uh, until now, you can find textbooks with grievous mistakes, not only of grammar, and, but of fact or outright lies. So every year during the um, budget debates, we have to remind the Department of Education, please clean up these textbooks. Take off the uh, reading lists of schools, those books which are most uh, notorious for peddling uh, either at worst peddling these lies or at best uh, letting historical uh, mistakes um, slip through. We keep asking the DepEd, uh, maybe you should uh, print your own books aside from vetting uh, more carefully what come to you from uh, various publishing houses. And please also train your teachers to handle this material and to have the orientation themselves of faithfulness to retelling of history uh, so that we, we don't get lessons like, okay, what is each Philippine president known for? So Manuel El Quezon was known for this, Manuel Rojas was known for this, Ferdinand Marcos was known for infrastructure. What the? I mean, what, what, what infrastructure did he de uh, demolish and what, what lethal infrastructure did he, did he set up? And I mentioned earlier that the Marcos estate has been using their plundered resources to fund in social media and in various, uh, through various channels, a grand historical revisionism project about how great the martial law years were, the best times of the country so far, so we must return to it. And they are peddling this propaganda, especially to young people who can't have a memory and who don't have a vicarious memory of the martial law uh, dictatorship. And we, that, that education has to be done not just in the formal educational sphere, but the, the informal and also the non-formal. So trainings, alternative, there's an alternative learning system in DepEd and through the mass media also, which is under heavy attack from the president. The Catholic Church, it was wonderful to discover in the last three years that Though the Catholic Church hierarchy are never our allies on gender issues, not on the reproductive health law before, not now on the SOGI equality or anti-discrimination bill. They won't be when we refile the divorce bill. But we rediscovered that on issues of human rights, on issues of uh, rule of law, they are, or at least some of them, are our allies. And the hierarchy is not stopping them from speaking out. Unfortunately, um, the cardinal hasn't spoken up so strongly yet. I do believe he has his heart in the right place. But right now, it is left to a small but slowly growing number of his brother bishops to speak out. And courageously, uh, the most prominent of them is Bishop Pablo Virgilio or Ambo David of Calaocan City, where Kian, the boy, was killed. And Bishop Ambo and the Integrated Bar of the Philippines, and I shared this with the lawyers yesterday, and I, we collectively took the three witnesses, including two minors, into our custody, therefore the kidnapping case. So, but Bishop David was really like a guardian angel uh, in that whole process. And there are others, um, uh, if I could mention, uh, uh, Archbishop Palma in Cebu, uh, Archbishop uh, Ledesma in Cagayan de Oro, uh, a young bishop in Bataan was the latest to, um, to speak out. And then bishops emeritus in Metro Manila, bishops Iniguez and Tobias, uh, Bishop Pabilio of Manila, 
So these are the small but growing number of bishops who are speaking out. And of course, as during martial law, even before the Catholic Bishops' Conference started to move, the women and men religious, the association of major religious superiors in the Philippines, have been and very much on the ground starting to work with EJK families, the widows, the orphans, to try to um, help them seek justice, to help them process their terrible trauma, to provide them uh, livelihood support so that the women who are now the sole or the new breadwinners can still uh, raise the children well. Um, um, and the, the military. The military are also heavily courted by the president. Um, unfortunately, the Philippine National Police is probably almost completely as an institution uh, on his side. The armed forces has somehow, and it, in certain moments that you might have noticed, has somehow been able to uh, keep a little bit of uh, themselves at a little bit of arm's length from the president. But I don't know how long that will hold because he courts them as seriously, the, the uh, level of the commanders, uh, and then each, especially uh, class of the Philippine Military Academy. And I know this because my late husband was a PMA graduate. He was a, uh, an officer in the National Police. Um, and the president um, has really been courting them not just raising their um, salaries and improving their benefits, which public employees deserve, but hey, when are the teachers gonna have that? When are the public health workers going to have that also? Um, but by um, shielding them from any accountability as he enjoys impunity for the crimes against citizens that he goads them to commit, promising that um, he will have um, their back. And I'm afraid that the corruption that marks this administration uh, still, and uh, if reports are true uh, to, to an even more intensity, we have not spared the national police and the armed forces. But having said all that, um, there are also uh, retired military and police officers who feel very strongly about this China and the West Philippine Sea issue, who really resent the um, the swallowing of insults without a pushback. Also because I think some of these retired people are former Navy FOIX or flag officers in command, former National Defense Secretaries, who in their younger years were part of the Philippines' um, bold, rather adventurous attempts to stake our claim on the various parts of the South China Sea. But, um, uh, debates on martial law in Mindanao and extension of martial law, uh, public discussions about the president wandering aloud about, mm, maybe I'll declare martial law nationwide, or the president wandering aloud about revolutionary government. As long as there's some constitutional garb to what he does or what he says, when the press interview the military, they will usually say, as long as it's provided for by the constitution, they get antsy when he talks about revolutionary government because that's extra constitutional. So it's a, it's a bit mysterious uh, for us uh, because the, the military are supposed to be not politicized as an institution, but we do know that they are, after all, also citizens. And throughout history, we have had some of them who, uh, who share our values also, including during these such terrible times, so we'll see. So my question for you is, um, you talked about the threats to yourself, the criminal attacks or accusations, the threats to your family, and just being a minority in the Senate. My question for you is, what is your why that keeps you going even through these hard times? Oh, it's the same why for, any one of us, um, the things that uh, originally inspired us to choose our kind of life. Um, uh, Gustavo Gutierrez had, had uh, one of his books is To Drink From Our Own Wells, and one of our leaders, one of our heroes in the Philippines, uh, Jose Capepe Diocno, he sort of paraphrased it uh, by uh, about also 
drinking from our own wells. So the things that originally um, captured our hearts, that's why we chose this life. Those are also the things that uh, keep me going. I, I go back to those waters to recharge. So whether it's uh, uh, pride in being Filipino, um, my love for the people I love and the, the people who love me, um, nature, she's so beautiful, arts and culture, so exciting, so beautiful, so liberating, uh, our faith. Well, I, I was born Catholic, I, my late husband and I had baptized our children as Catholic, uh, and we told them, but you know, Catholicism is just so you have roots, uh, a tradition to begin from, and then you go on your own spiritual search. You take, you, you take your own wing. Um, so our, our spirit, whatever spirituality we choose, and humanism is as full a spirituality as any for me. Um, what else? Things like that. So just, I guess it's the same for everyone. Just the things that inspire us to to be in this space. We. Uh, we, the activists turn to burn out, and that's, I think, an important lesson the movement has learned. So yeah, there's you know, care of the soul, and we have to take care of each other. When we're burning out, we have to stop, you know, rest, sleep, <laughs> recharge, because it's a long journey. It's a long struggle, yeah, and we're in it together. <laughs> Welcome, Senator. Um, earlier, you mentioned the youth, the Phil M youth, and for them to have a role in fighting for your democracy. Can you talk to that very specifically? What can they do? Because later on, there will be a, a need of young people coming to the Philippines to observe and to see what the political situation is in the Philippines and what they can do about it. Please speak to that more clearly. And also, um, what do you have to say to your critics who say, you can do much more than what you've done? But you can, but, but how do you address that? Uh, I don't. <laughs> I just, uh, Akabayan has a, has a, I think, ambitious enough platform of governance that guides our legislative agenda working in the Senate and in the House. And we need to increase not just our membership, but through coalition work, our allies, so that we can do more. Uh, so we need to reproduce uh, ourselves more, like-minded uh, fellow travelers. Um, and it's like what those who came before us passed on to us, uh, we will pass on to the youth. So here's where I connect uh, to the earlier part um, of, your, of your question. Because maybe our task will never be completed. We can just contribute a few more pieces of it to um, the mosaic that was already handed down to us at great price by those who came before. But, and then it will be the next generation and generations who will complete it and make it make it even better. Um, the things that we cannot do, we have to create the environment for them to be able to do it uh, after we are gone. So I'm very glad that there will be uh, young Phil Ams who are going to the Philippines to look into the situation there. Uh, I hope that, and I know, it will be a very enriching experience for them, especially um, if they can talk you know, with all their hearts open around the circle with informal settlers and peasants and other basic sectors on the ground in their communities. And if these young people can ask all the questions and um, form their opinions based on these uh, encounters in ways that may be guided by our values, but also maybe in new ways, in ways that we haven't contemplated. Because maybe they're going to ask questions different from what we know to ask. And they may ask them in ways that are different from the ways that we know to ask. And coming back home, I'm sure that that experience will be an invaluable resource for them to 
reintegrate in the Philam community here in the United States and probably spark more and new and more vibrant um, coalitions with other sections of um, the Phil Am uh, the Phil Am community. I hope also while they're there that they will be able to and open to uh, talk with as broad a uh, section as possible of Filipino uh, organizations who are always excited when there are young balikbayan who are there, who want to know our history and who want to be part of crafting the history that still lies ahead. You were, in your film, you know, uh, Duterte was talking about comparing himself to Hitler, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, uh, Trump and Duterte are really similar, similar. but uh, Trump could never do that. That would give the game away. He could lock up babies, but I don't think he could do that, you know? And, uh, and then the other thing is, uh, I wonder, when Filipinos think about the United States, I mean, are they that aware, you know, of the horrors of the uh, American colonization that much? And uh, just kind of curious. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't expect that question, but it's really interesting for me. Well, uh, in any post-colonial situation, the smaller country usually thinks about, even knows more about the bigger country than vice versa. We're even more curious about the United States, I'm sure, than the US is curious about us. Um, but take any survey these days, um, there is still a high um, degree of affection for the United States, also because of um, some good that was left behind after that traumatic experience, and also because, of course, of all the waves of uh, migration to, to the United States from the Philippines. I was so amazed, Cindy, learning at the Filipino Workers' Center in LA that it didn't only begin with the Manongs to the plantations in Hawaii. Uh, there, there's a Filipino settlement in Louisiana in the 1700s, and wow, some Filipinos jumped ship from the Acapulco Manila Galleon trade route on the seas, and we're here in 1500, 80s, just 20 years after Legaspi went back to the Philippines. So it's just mind blowing, wow. So yeah, any survey, there's that affection for the United States. Also in similar surveys, um, barely disguised uh, animosity towards China. And I'm afraid it's not just because of the way she's bullying us in the West Philippine Sea and our government is taking it. I'm afraid it's also because of uh, a shameful latent uh, anti-Chinese sentiment among Filipinos, you know, just below the surface of the skin. So we're always careful to say, you know, our quarrel is with Beijing, with, the, with China's government, not with her people who have their own problems with their government. Um, so, and yes, uh, and I'm proud to say at least the history of the American colonization of the Philippines, we do tell. I have to check though, if we tell it as badly as the history of martial law, or if we tell it as well as we should, uh, but we are proud to say that in when, when uh, Rizal had first imagined the Filipino nation and Bonifacio had been inspired by Rizal, the Katipunan had formed and uh, if Rizal had lived, I think he would have joined the Katipunan when he saw that we were ready. His older brother, Pasiano, became a Katipunan general with, with Bonifacio. Many young people joined, as joined the various movements for freedom and change in all the decades that followed up to now. When, uh, we're proud to say that when Bonifacio wrote, uh, I think it was Admiral Dewey, he, he said, he, he appealed to him to seize and desist, invoking the principles of the American War of Independence, invoking the values of that great North American nation, said God Andres Bonifacio. And we are proud to say that the Katipunan or an Aguinaldo were at Manila's door, had practically brought the Spanish forces to their knees. No offense to our compañera from who was here earlier, but then came in the United States. 
And we are also glad to remember the solidarity of Mark Twain and other Americans like him who opposed American annexation and America's late entry into the age of empire in the Philippines. And we, I also became an activist as a teenager in high school because of the uh, US military bases and the whole issue of nuclear plant and power and ship, nuclear powered ships and planes. So, sorry, I, I can see you moving closer. <laughs> so I think we're gonna go ahead and close now. I wanna thank the Senator for coming to this this States. So thank you again for coming and hope to see you soon. Thanks.